Broadcasting from beautiful downtown Tallahassee, it's Nantan Lupan at the drive-in. Welcome to episode 22, First Men in the Moon, 1964. We are following the Lionel Jeffries line from The Revenge of Frankenstein, 1958. This is a great movie based on an H.G. Wells story. This movie was very enjoyable, mostly because of Lionel Jeffries. I also learned that H.G. Wells is a hack, but more about that later. Edward Judd was the star of the movie, playing Arnold Beckford, but Jeffrey stole all the scenes he was in. Judd is an English actor that started stage work when he was a teenager. By 16, he made his film debut in The Hideout, 1948. He made numerous movies through the 60s that include Sink the Bismarck, 1960, The Day the Earth Caught Fire, 1961, The Longships, 1964, and Invasion, 1966. Following the 60s, he worked mostly in television through the 1990s. Martha Heyer played Kate Callender, an American from Boston who was the love interest of Bedford. Heyer was born in Texas. By 1946, she was getting small parts in movies. She had a good run of movies in the 50s with such films as Down Three Dark Streets, 1954, Showdown at Abilene, 1956, Battle Hymn, 1957, and the 1958 remake of Some Came Running with Frank Sinatra. After this, her career trailed off with her doing television and an occasional movie. Lionel Jeffries played the role of the slap-happy inventor Joseph Caver. I discussed Jeffries in episode 21, The Revenge of Frankenstein, so I won't go into more detail here. Story The story begins in 1964 with a spaceship, United Nations One, landing on the moon with an international crew. The people that fear a one-world government must be wetting themselves at the thought. As the whole world watches, a Russian, an Englishman, and an American leave the ship. I assume that the Englishman and the American are astronauts, which means star voyager, while the Russian would be a cosmonaut, which means universe voyager. Anyway, they're poking around and looking at rocks when the Russian cosmonaut finds a Union Jack flag and a piece of paper claiming the moon in the name of Queen Victoria I who lived from 1837 to 1901. The paper was dated 1899. Colonel, we found something. You'd better take a look. Claim for a majesty Queen Victoria in the year of our Lord, 1899. It is very fortunate that the Russian found the paper given the Cold War tensions. If the English astronaut found it, the other two would have cried foul. They get the paper back to their ship and send it by space fax back to the UN headquarters. The note is written on a summons for Kate Callender, Martha Heyer, so a multinational delegation heads to the record office in a quiet English town. After a little bit of doing, the clerk remembers Kate Callender and that although she has passed, her husband, Arnold Bedford, played by Edward Judd, is still alive and is in the local nursing home. Well, you know, it's weddings, weddings, they always perfect me. They do, even now. Look at this stuff. They never affected me, much to my regret. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Remember that? I married her from Boston, Massachusetts. Well, I saw there must be Catherine Count. Was. Uh, she, she died some ten years ago. Uh, this Mr. Bedford, is he still alive? Yes, he'd be one, he'd be in this good book. The delegation goes to the home and finds out that Arnold is unaware of the space mission. When they talk to him, he thinks they are there because of the warning letters he has been sending out for decades. When he learns that men are on the moon, he warns the delegation to get them home. You found them on the moon, didn't you? Yes. Yes. There's been an expedition. They didn't tell me. It's there now. There now? Well, they mustn't. They're in great danger. Arnold begins to tell his tale. He has moved into a country cottage where he intends to write a play. He is deeply in debt and is renting the cottage. His American girlfriend, Kate, shows up in a motor car. He lies to her and says he owns the cottage. Nice boyfriend. He claims that a lot of his money is tied up in boots for the Boer War. This war took place from 1899 to 1902 and saw the British Empire fighting Dutch settlers in South Africa. Arnold takes Kate's car into town and the next door neighbor, Joseph Caver, Lionel Jeffries, drops by and wants to buy the cottage. He is concerned that his experiments are dangerous. Caver remembers his experiments and runs off, leaving his bicycle behind. You mean you want to buy Cherry Cottage? Yes, I do, yes, yes. Well, how much were you figuring? Well, um, I'm not very good at this sort of thing. Um, I thought perhaps a thousand pounds or perhaps a little more. 
Well, that's $5,000. Yes. Well, the cottage has been in Mr. Bedford's family for a very long time. He has a deep, sentimental attachment for it. I know, yes. Well, you see, the trouble is, my experiments have cost me so much up to now. Of course, I might be able to double it. I when Arnold returns, he puts the bike into the car and heads to Caver's house. Arnold knows he can't sell the cottage because he doesn't own it. Caver is cooking up his anti-gravity paint that he has named Caverite. Kindly tell me exactly what it is you're trying to do in a simple language, if you don't mind, because you see, I'm not a scientist. Now, you know that you can use screens like this to cut off light and heat. By the same token, you can cut off Marconi's wireless rays with sheets of lead. But nothing up to now will cut off the force of gravity. Oh, gravity, yes, of course, the, the pull of the Earth, what holds us on the ground. Yes, that's right, that's right. Now, what I'm experimenting with is a sort of coating, or rather a metallic paste, which will, in point of fact, cut off the force of gravity. Arnold sees the paint working when he is lifted to the ceiling in a chair. After that, Arnold is all in. He will do anything to get a share of the money that is going to be made from Cavorite. He talks about the war applications if it was painted on the bottom of boots. How had you thought of using Cavorite? Well, nothing very practical, I'm afraid. Something like a trip to the moon. Caver shows Arnold his moon ship, which looks vaguely like a World War II sea mine. The sphere. You've actually built it. Yes. Yes. He is ready to go on a two-person round trip to the moon. Arnold agrees to sell the cottage he doesn't own to Caver. Arnold has Kate sign the paper selling the cottage with a cock and bull story about hiding it from his debtors. Now, if you'll sign there, that's the deed assigning Cherry Cottage to you. But why bring me into it? Oh, darling, I've explained. I'm selling the cottage and it's got to be done in the proper way. You see, Cavers solicitors need papers and documents. Now, don't put my signature to them. If my creditors get wind of the fact that I've come into money, it's the last I'll see of it. You're sure there's nothing dishonest about it? No, 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 it's just a legal device. Nice boyfriend. Sometime later, Kate is given a summons for fraudulently selling the cottage. Uh, Kathleen, uh, calendar? Yes. <clears throat> I give formal notice that this summons is served on behalf of the landlord of Cherry Cottage. Summons? Just a minute, please. <clears throat> I believe there has been an illegal attempt to transfer the title deed to a third party. And your signature is on this paper, madam. But Mr. Bedford inherited the cottage from his aunt. Cherry Cottage is the sole property of our clients. She is mad as a hen. Caver blows the roof off his house and Kate goes to find Arnold and they make up. She brings him an elephant gun, chickens, and feed. What on earth have you got there? I brought a few useful things for Arnold, though I wouldn't want him to know it. Just a gin and bitters and some personal things. Gin and bitters. Gin and bitters. A few personal things. Like an elephant gun. It's a sensible precaution. You don't know what you'll meet. The ship takes off with Caver and Arnold and by accident Kate. Geese I adore. Chickens I detest. Caver pilots the ship to the moon, landing by controlling the Caverite. When the two men are ready to explore, they put Kate in an airtight cabinet. They get into the deep sea diving suits, complete with brass helmets. In the Wells book, he did not have suits because he wrote that the moon had an atmosphere. This could have been disproven at the time because the moon's disk would have had a haze around the edge when viewed by a telescope. Their spacesuits didn't have gloves, and there is much debate about what would happen. Most sites seem to indicate it would cause swelling, pain, and bruising, and no long-term damage if they didn't go too long. The two moonwalkers leave the flag and the note, and then discover an insect colony living underground on the moon. Hence the title, First Men In, Not On the Moon. Caver names them Selenites after the Greek goddess Selene. The two men escape back to the ship, and find that it has been drugged underground with Kate still inside. This seems to have been used in the Time Machine 1960s where the Morlocks drug the Time Machine underground. Hack. Also, I want to take a minute to warn you to never watch the Time Machine 2002. If you do, you will try to build a Time Machine to get those two hours back. Just saying. The two men find the drag trail for the ship and head into the underground bug city to find Kate. They are attacked by a giant caterpillar. The Selenites eventually kill the moon bull with their stun rays. The two earthlings realize that the Selenite city is powered by sunlight that focuses through a large glass panel. The Selenites begin communicating, but they have to power down regularly. 
Arnold slips away and finds the ship being disassembled by the Selenites. Once the Selenites have learned English, they begin to have conversations with Caver. It's Caverite. We have tried to duplicate the substance coated on your sphere, but unable. Caver thinks it is about scientific exchange, but Arnold thinks they are putting the Earth Man on trial. Finally, Caver is admitted to see the big guy, the Grand Lunar. Starvation, hostility, even war. Tell me. Oh. Arnold tries to get Caver to escape, and in the struggle, the elephant gun is fired at the Grand Lunar. Caver decides to stay behind in the name of science. You know how to man the controls. You don't need me. Caver, don't be a fool! Come back! You see, I'm staying. Better not, man. There's a lot to learn. Arnold and Kate escape and fly the ship through the glass and back to the Earth. As Arnold finishes his story, he says the ship splashed down near Zanzibar and sank. They never heard from Caver again. Of course, no one ever believed our story. I mean, there was no evidence, nothing. Until now. Oh, I still can't believe it. Our own Mr. Bedford, a real astronaut. Back in the present, Arnold and the delegation watch the television as the Astros slash cosmonauts are breaking into the Selenite City. It is decayed and there is no life there. That's where we were. More evidence of civilization. It appears to be a lunar city. They barely escape as the city falls down around them. Arnold looks out the window and comments on how bad Caver's cold was and how the Selenites had no immunity. Some simple germ brought from Earth. To creatures completely without immunity. Under those conditions, microorganisms could run wild, multiply, kill a whole population. Did they? Poor Caver. He did have such a terrible cold. He smiles. Of course, Wells used this bit in War of the Worlds 1953. What a hack. Notes. The effects for this film were done by the master Ray Harryhausen. Because of the film ratio, many of the models had to be sculpted in squeezed dimensions so they would appear normal in the film. World famous short summary, Boyfriend Reforms After a Short Trip Abroad. Hope you enjoyed today's podcast. Remember, you can find all of the links at snarkymoviereviews.com and I appreciate those reviews in iTunes.